Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today in the best drone for STEM education webinar. My name is Renee Childress and I'm the marketing assistant here at PCS Adventures. Before we officially dive in, we'd love to see who's joining us. Type your name and where you're tuning in from in the GoToWebinar chat panel on the right hand side of your screen. I'm joining here from the PCS headquarters in Boise, Idaho. I see Bethany's joined us from Indiana. We've got James, Kim, Luis, keep those responses coming. As everyone continues to log on and send those responses, we'll do a quick orientation of GoToWebinar. Right now, you'll see the slides, and when we get started, you'll see Tyler and Michelle on one side of the screen. Once they start that webcam, there will be a slider between the two windows so you can adjust your view. Everyone will be muted during the presentation, but we will save time for questions at the end. So throughout the presentation, type any questions that come up in the question box in the control panel on the right-hand side of the screen. We'll address as many of those questions as possible during the Q&A segment of the webinar. At the end of the webinar, there will be a quick survey, so please do stick around and answer those questions to help us improve our future webinars. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Tyler and Michelle. Tyler is our STEM Education Specialist and Training Coordinator. Michelle is our Director of STEM Development at PCS. Both of these two have extensive experience in education, both inside and outside of the classroom, and they develop the innovative curriculum that we offer here at PCS Adventures. All right, Hello, well, everybody. Hello. Uh, <laughs> welcome. Thanks for, uh, for joining us. We're excited to be here today to talk about uh, our drone offerings and uh, to get a little bit of information to you about um, you know, some of our newer products and what you can do to get your students going with drones. Um, so as Renee said, my name is Tyler Downey. I'm the STEM Specialist and Training Coordinator here at PCS. This is Michelle, uh, Michelle Fisher. She is the Director of STEM Development. And I think we will uh, just kind of dive right in and, and go ahead and get started. So um, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, so a quick look at our agenda for the day. Uh, we're gonna talk briefly a little bit about why drones and STEM. So uh, talking a little bit about how drones can be used to inspire students uh, to be more interested in STEM, generally speaking, and then looking at some more specific reasons why drones are a good tool for teaching uh, all the branches in STEM, science, tech, engineering, and math. We're going to look at our latest and greatest programmable drone options. This is something new that we um, are just rolling out here in 2019 for grades four through 12. We have some programmable drone options now, which is something that we're really excited to be offering. Uh, drone blocks, coding with drones. We're going to talk about our update to Ready, Set, Drone, which is our drone camp for grades four through eight. We have a second edition of that uh, that has some pretty significant changes from the first edition. Um, and then we're going to talk about our advanced coding bundle, which will go along with our Discover Drones program. The advanced coding bundle is not quite ready yet, but we are on the verge of finishing and expect to have that uh, release in June. And uh, then we'll have some time for some questions and answers at the end. And then at the very end, as Renee said, we have a little survey. We'd love it if you could take the time to fill that out. And uh, there'll be some handouts uh, at the end too, available to you to look at, to kind of review as you think about what we're presenting here today. So moving right into why drones and STEM. So if you are joining us for the first time, if you're not familiar with PCS Adventures, um, if you're relatively new to STEM, the chances are still pretty good that you have heard about drones. You know what drones are. Um, most people, when they hear the word drone, the first thing that comes to mind is a remotely controlled vehicle of some kind that has multiple propellers, um, oftentimes has a camera on it. So it's um, an unmanned aerial vehicle. So you'll often hear the words UAV, uh, the acronym instead of drone, and those are kind of interchangeable. It's an unmanned aerial vehicle. Um, there are lots of types of UAVs for lots of types of purposes. And so um, using UAVs, drones as a platform for teaching STEM education can branch into a whole variety of fields in the sciences and the engineering. So uh, continuing forward, um, when you hear drones, uh, most often people think about quadcopters, the drones that have four propellers. Um, quadcopters are used in drone racing, they're used for surveillance. Um, if you've seen them on the news, you've probably heard about drone delivery, um, you know, or maybe seen some issues around privacy in drones, that kind of thing. So we'll talk a little bit more about um, just how drones are becoming prevalent in modern culture. Um, moving on from there, we're going to talk a little bit about career paths, you know, what options are available for those students that are going to be, you know, moving into the workforce in the next five to 10 years, and the opportunity there that they have 
for very lucrative careers. Um, the drone industry is booming right now and it doesn't seem like it's gonna be slowing anytime soon. Um, looking at competition and sports as they relate to drones. Um, drone racing is a more and more legitimate sport. Um, you know, there are international competitions with giant purses, getting lots of sponsorship. Um, the International Drone Racing League uh, competition this year is gonna be aired for the first time on a major network. Uh, so that's really interesting and inspiring. You have students that are maybe uh, more inclined towards the gaming side of things will really take to uh, the idea of drones and drone racing. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about just the different types of community that being involved with drones can, um, you know, that, that's available to you. All the different ways that people are using drones, they're putting them into action. Um, there are many organic communities that have grown up around those different uses. So getting your community involved. Um, when it comes to drones, it's something that's really easy to do and good for teachers and good for students. So we're gonna continue on here and intro uh, slide into our drone related careers so thinking about drone related careers the opportunity as i said just a minute ago is unprecedented in terms of growth uh, another acronym that you will often hear is uas which stands for unmanned aerial systems so it's not just the drones and the drone pilots but it's the science and the engineering that goes into making drone flight possible and so you know as we move into the future, these careers, you know, we don't even know yet what some of these career opportunities are gonna be. Um, you know, we can look back over the last four years or so and see this exponential growth in, a multiple, uh, in, in multiple areas with drones being used professionally. Um, and so we're gonna take a second here to look at some of those industries and to just kind of talk about how drones are used in, in a variety of professional ways, okay? So agriculture is probably the area where drones really kind of exploded in terms of being used in a way that um, was innovative and, and fresh and new. So looking at uh, drone use in agriculture, when farmers or ranchers, even five or 10 years ago, wanted to go out and survey their fields or, you know, treat crops with pesticides or, um, you know, just collect data on these large areas of land, they oftentimes would have to hire a helicopter or an airplane and pay for a pilot and you know pay for the fuel and pay for all the you know extra chemicals that would spray that maybe weren't you know being used efficiently and in the last few years costs have come down dramatically for collecting that kind of data for um, because of drone usage and so <clears throat> soil and field analysis looking at uh, planting there are drones out there now that can actually go out and uh, autonomously plant crops like trees. Um, the US Forest Service recently uh, did a study where they were using drones to shoot seed pods into the ground in the areas where they wanted to reforest that were difficult for people to get to on foot. Um, crop spraying, crop monitoring, um, looking at irrigation and monitoring irrigation systems using drones, and then uh, just health assessment, scanning uh, your crops in your fields using a variety of sensors that um, you can put on drones cheaply to collect valuable data that will help you better manage your your uh, crops or your your livestock. So a lot of opportunity in the field of agriculture. Do you have anything to add, Michelle? No. As we go through? Good. Some okay. Of that was really well. <laughs> kind of speaking directly. Really excited about the the opportunity. Um, you know, here in Idaho, uh, a farmer in a local community pretty close here to Boise several years ago was kind of one of the early pioneers of using drone technology to um, you know to improve his performance at his farm and to reduce his costs. And he was so successful that um, he was bought out by an international company to the tunes of tens of millions of dollars. And they've implemented his product and his model um, in you know, their facilities all across the world. So you know, drone use in agriculture kind of uh, has some really strong roots here in, in Idaho. So it's exciting. Um, another area of industry where we're seeing more and more drone use on a regular basis is in surveillance and inspection. So looking at, um, you know, that is a kind of a twofold thing, public safety, first off, um, police departments all around the country have implemented drones to try to, you know, reduce the danger to um, individual officers uh, who may be going into a situation where, um, you know, it just wouldn't be safe for a person to go. We, uh, you know, you'd be really hard pressed to find any town of any size right now that doesn't have some sort of drone program either already up and running or in the works when it comes to uh, surveillance for public safety. 
you know, that doesn't just apply to uh, situations like, you know, bomb threats and live shooter situations, but um, also into things like, uh, you know, disaster management, uh, forest fires. You know, a lot of government agencies are able to use drones now to, again, collect data and survey things in a way that's cheaper and safer than ever before. So the um, inspection uh, aspect of surveillance, the construction industry right now currently is probably the industry where the most growth has come in terms of implementation of drone technology in that construction sites around the world, people are using drones to collect data on these massive uh, construction projects. So again, before where they might have had to use, you know, a helicopter or an airplane for aerial surveillance to, you know, measure um, the precise nature of, of these massive buildings, you're able to use drone technology now. And so uh, the growth in that field is is huge. And moving on to photography and videography. Um, drones are, you know, everywhere in our culture now in terms of their video. If you go onto YouTube, uh, you'll see, you know, drone videos taken left and right. Drone photography is really huge. Um, realtors around the world are using drones more and more frequently to take uh, pictures of their places that they're trying to sell. Um, and, you know, this is a place where anybody that has their drone pilot's license can start picking up jobs and money and work uh, right now and right away because there's a huge demand for people that can competently photo and video from, from drone technology. Likewise, you know, in Hollywood and some of the bigger movie type productions, drones are replacing uh, like mobile boom cams and that sort of thing in order to take footage that, you know, are pennies on the dollar for what it would have cost even five years ago. So the artistic aspects of using drones and the drone cameras, um, you know, can't be can't be underestimated. They're they're huge. They're showing up everywhere in photography and videography industry. And then delivery. If uh, you know, if you are aware of some of the videos and the information, like news stories go out all the time about companies wanting to do drone delivery. You'll see advertisements from uh, you know things, places like KFC. Um, you know, they're working on implementing a drone delivery system or Domino's Pizza. Uh, Amazon is a huge one. Um, and so for the last couple of years, this idea of drone delivery has kind of been looming on the horizon. Um, and it was just a couple of weeks ago that the FAA, who regulates the airspace in the United States, um, officially sanctioned the first official drone delivery um, location and apparatus for Google Wing, which is Google's drone delivery service. Um, in the state of Virginia. So drone delivery is actually a reality in our country right now, you know, and looking at how uh, that works as they move forward with their delivery in terms of regulating the airspace and keeping things safe, um, you know, it's going to expand out from Virginia, but it is a reality. And Google did beat Amazon just barely <laughs> in terms of uh, legally uh, using autonomous drones for product delivery. And then scientific applications. Um, you know, scientists are a creative lot. There are many ways that um, scientists are innovating using drones to collect data in uh, ways that are less invasive and cheaper than ever before. Um, the picture here on the slide uh, is of a scientist who is using a drone to um, survey and, and monitor polar bear movement off in the distance using an infrared camera. And so they're able to, you know, look out across this mostly appearing to be blank white landscape and they're able to get fairly close to some animals that wouldn't respond well to large vehicles or people getting close to you know just to survey and to monitor them um you know there is uh michelle can tell you about one of her favorites uh, that's the <clears throat> the mit scientist the scientist that did the snot bot tell them about the snot bot Ooh, I actually got to meet the people that flew the snot bot over the summer and was just completely starstruck because these are some of the first scientists I heard of. So they took a DJI Phantom, um, similar to the one you see there, and they wanted to collect DNA samples from the whales they were studying, which you can imagine is a difficult thing to do. Um, so they actually would use their drones and position them so that on the whales breached and then came up for air and had their blow come out of their snot, they could capture that with the drone and then get the DNA sample. So it was a cool example of like what Tyler talked about before too, of the entire UAS 
system because they not only needed the pilots, but they also had to develop a software to help them predict where to put the drone to have the greatest likelihood of collecting an actual DNA sample. And then from there, it's been cool to see. I feel like every year there's some new project coming out with scientists using the drones to collect different types of data. The great thing about the drone use for data collection in that way is that it's much less invasive. Like, you know, before they came up with a snot pot, if they wanted a DNA sample from a whale, they had to use basically what was a type of spear where they would go up and they would actually puncture the whale's skin and take the skin sample and get the DNA, uh, DNA that way. So it was a lot less uh, invasive in, you know, in terms of the observation, too. It's just much less invasive to have a very small machine like this rather than, you know, a huge crew on, you know, snowmobiles or, with, you know, big cameras and that sort of thing moving into the space uh, where these animals live. So a lot of opportunity ahead um, for scientific application. And that touches on what we talked about at the very beginning of really see drones as a platform for STEM. So yes, well, there are careers where you are full-time piloting a drone. That's kind of the tip of the iceberg. So if you're gonna be in science, it's nice to know about drones in your tool set. If you're gonna be a data scientist, you're probably gonna use data from drones. If you're gonna be a computer scientist, you may design software that integrates with drones. So exactly. it's always cool to tell kids about, even if this isn't your full-time gig, you may wanna know about drones because it will probably be a part of your life in some way. Yeah, if you're working in some field of STEM, you're probably going to either be working with or adjacent to drone yeah. use as a tool. So, so the last aspect is the competitive sport aspect. So this photo was taken from um, an international drone race in Paris last year. And I believe the first place purse for this particular race was um, in the tens of thousands of dollars. And they had 150,000 spectators watching this live. Um, and so drone racing, the, the very first international drone race was in 2014. So we're talking about um, a competitive sport that is very, very young and so there's a lot of opportunity there for the competitive types or you know the gamer types to really learn some skills that can translate outside of that sport arena um but also that they can just get involved within the sport as well there are local chapters popping up all over the world of uh, different drone racing leagues where you can compete and then work your way up and so uh, as a competitive sport drones are and drone racing really is kind of here to stay and the best pilots are always kids Oh, the best pilots. I did a presentation uh, in December for a school and did some research. And at that time, the uh, international winner of a competition in Australia was a 15-year-old boy who won $22,000. Second place was a nine-year-old girl who won $11,000. So, yeah, the kids, uh, it's its really, that, it's a very strong hook for a lot of kids that might otherwise feel intimidated because they don't have a lot of access to technology, um, you know, to, to enter into an aspect of STEM you know, that feels comfortable because they're at least familiar with some of, you know, the interface, like the gaming style controller using remote control and that sort of thing can be uh, familiar and inviting. Okay, okay so looking at the job market, um, the number of full-time UAS, and remember UAS related jobs, uh, that stands for the unmanned aerial system. So we're not talking just the drone pilots, but the scientists and the engineers that go into, um, you know, to put their efforts into making drone flight possible. Um, these statistics I collected just a couple of weeks ago, so as of May of this year, for this month, there were 2,193 open jobs listed on Indeed, 1,008 on Monster, and then 2,300 or so on Glassdoor. And these are nationwide. Nationwide. Mm -hmm. And these are all jobs that have been open, you know, for a week or more, and some of them have been open for months because there's just not enough qualified pilots and people with the skills and the know-how uh, in the drone industry yet to fulfill these jobs. So. You know, if you're teaching at that upper level um, and, you know, you're and you have students that are really kind of concerned about what do they want to do when they get out of school, what can, you know, what can they do in a field that, that they're interested in? The UAS field is wide open and the growth is, is uh, like I said, unprecedented and doesn't seem to be slowing down anytime soon. So for an, a full time drone pilot, the average salary is about seventy five thousand dollars a year. And if you are one of the engineers or developers that works behind the scenes to make that flight possible, uh, the salaries typically start in the six figures. So while we don't, you know, think that that is the end all be all of uh, the importance of drones and drone technology in STEM, it's definitely something worth considering. And you know, these are skills that students can, um, you know, can can acquire fairly quickly, um, either through like CTI programs or through like your typical four year college course. So there are a lot of different branches, um, a lot of different paths to participating in, in the drone industry. 
And that's one of the cool things that we get to provide in educational space. There are so many people that have their Part 107 commercial license, and yet there's still all these jobs. And so to provide that experience beyond, okay, I have this license, but have you actually flown? Can you build the drone? Do you have those UAS skills? And so we'll talk about this more later, but you know, like what are the valuable skills to get into the drone industry beyond just being a certified pilot that right. has a DJI drone? All right. Okay, so before we um, continue on, we're going to spend the rest of the time in this webinar talking about a couple of things. The first thing we're going to look at are some of our newest offerings here at PCS. Um, you know, over the time that we've had our drone products available to the public, one of the things that people have asked for again and again is a programmable drone option. And so 2019, we have finally been able to develop a quality programmable option um, for drones. And so we're going to talk about some of our drone programming uh, camps and options, and then we'll talk about some updates to our Ready Set Drone, which is our drone product that's targeted towards uh, upper elementary and middle school. And then we'll talk about Discover Drones, which is our kind of more advanced, um, more targeted to seventh to twelfth grade uh, drone product. And then we'll talk about some good pairings, like what are some of the ways that we can combine together the um, programming products that we have with the drone products that we have. So that being said, we're gonna jump right into our Drone Blocks Camp. This is our first um, product that we've released for programming in drones. And um, like all of our PCS camps, if you are just joining us for the first time and you aren't familiar with PCS, um, our kind of model for our camps is that we develop 12 one-hour lessons that uh, come with all the materials necessary in order to carry it out. So they're great for teachers, but they're also great for those situations where maybe you don't have a licensed teacher that's going to be teaching this product, like at a summer camp or, you know, maybe at the Y after school or, you know, clubs and that sort of thing. Um, so the camps contain everything that you need to do all the lessons as well as extensions for going beyond just that typical 12 hours. And so Drone Box um, was developed. By Michelle, the uh, camp drone box camp was developed by Michelle here, and and that's actually not true. I don't want to take credit. No? The drone box camp, I worked behind the scenes, but the lesson credit, I have to give a shout out to Marissa Vickery at Drone Blocks developed these lessons. So while I, you know, put it into our template, we were really lucky to partner with the folks at Drone Blocks. Um, Marissa has been teaching with the drone block software for many, many years, and so she brings this incredible classroom experience. So while I would love to take credit for them, um, she's the one that really is the person that has put the heart and soul into this. This is true. And I was going to get to her, but yes, <laughs> I, uh, I kind of jumped the gun there. Yeah, drone blocks is, is great. Michelle's going to tell you a little bit more about what um, the drone block software is. So if you're familiar with any type of Blockly language like Scratch or Blockly, Drone Box is similar in nature, and um, if you want to talk a little bit more about what exactly it is, how does it work? Yeah, so Drone Blocks is, like Tyler said, a drag and drop programming software. Drone Blocks works for a wide range of DJI drones. Um, so if you've been waiting for us to answer the question, what is the best drone for STEM education? The one that you can see on the screen here would be one of our first picks. So yeah. Tyler has So if you can see, this is a DJI Tello. It is a mini drone, and we'll talk a little bit more about why mini drones are so useful in education. Uh, but the DJI Tello is the one that is paired up with the drone box camp mm -hmm. and um, it is fully programmable, uh, programmable using the drone box software. And so if you're teaching in that fourth to eighth grade level, which this camp curriculum is targeted for, um, being able to fly multiple drones at once is a huge plus. So if you have a larger drone, you have to take your whole class outside. It's still really cool because you're flying a drone, but to give each student a chance to fly their own mission is a huge plus. So that would be one of the reasons we definitely recommend the DJI Tello. It's also a really easy entry point. Um, we can personally attest to this drone has smashed people in the face, gotten tangled in, <laughs> gotten the, tangled hair, in the hair. Tyler it's had uh, that fun experience. And so something that isn't scary right. is really important. It's a very user-friendly drone with a lot of uh, high-level capabilities. It has some autonomous, uh, autonomous functions built into it that other drones in the uh, mini drone class uh, often don't. Mm -hmm. And it's something that students and frankly teachers that aren't really tech savvy or don't super uh, feel really comfortable with the tech can pick up and mm -hmm. use pretty quickly after uh, you know just going over the basic setup and instructions. 
Tyler has personally taught many people to fly a drone using the Tello. It's a super great, if you've never ever flown a drone before, it's really mellow. That said, your students are gonna master the basic drone controls really, really fast. And so drone blocks we really see is, okay, what's that next step? Because now you know how to go up and down and turn. How can you challenge your students past that? So this curriculum really does all autonomous missions. Students are coding, they're applying math concepts. And so even though it's a really simple, accessible language, I was actually doing it with some kids this morning. It was cool to see how quickly they could start doing loops and repeats, and you could even go quicker or deeper into variables and more complex concepts. Yeah, and so if you've done like Hour of Code before, if your yeah. students have seen Blockly before, they're gonna take to this right away. And it's amazing because you know once they do learn those basic skills and how a drone moves using the controls, then they get to pull these blocks from the menu. You can see the menu on the side with all the different options to create a whole variety of missions to make the drones move autonomously. And so, um, very engaging. Your students are gonna love it, you're gonna love it. It's, it's an amazing product and a, a great camp, so. And this would be another example of drones as a tool for STEM. Well, this is obviously not what you would do with a commercial drone pilot. It's a super exciting way to teach coding and computer science principles, which you could totally springboard into a more industry relevant skill. Yeah which is great because that's going to spring board us into our uh, next offering. Beautiful. Yes, the uh, Discover Drones Advanced Coding Bundle um, is going to be available, we expect, here within uh, you know three or four weeks by the end of June, we're hoping. And um, this is a bundle that would be typically added on to our Discover Drones product. So if you are one of those um, teachers that is working with kids in grades 7 through 12 and you have our RubyQ drone, which uh, we'll talk about it in a minute, but it's a lot more uh, sophisticated, a little more complex than the, than the DJI Tello. Um, this is an add-on where you start with the Tello doing some of the basic programming that you would have in our uh, Dronebox camp, and then you have advanced courses that go into much more complex um, algorithmic thinking and computer commands, and then uh, topping off with Python. And Python is, um, you know, its own well-established computer programming language. It's been around for a long time and you can do very sophisticated programming using Python. Um, you know, it is worth noting that if you're doing the Python add-on, you do have to have some sort of a, like a PC or a Mac yeah. and yeah, a real computer. Yeah. It won't do, you know, work on just the tablets the way that the drag and drop uh, drone box does. But it's, um, it's a full-on real computing language that, you know, they could take with them into industry. Yeah, I was talking to one of my friends that's an engineer at SpaceX, and I was so excited when she said they're making all of their engineers learn Python. So it's like, that's exactly what we're doing. So if they're doing it at SpaceX, it has to be a good idea. Right, exactly. The so, other thing, oh, oh I'm sorry, no, Tyler, to go ahead here. The other thing that this one touches on too is the coding, but also some really deep math concepts. So I know one thing Droneblox has mentioned too is that one of the places they've seen a lot of integration with this is both in tech and computer science, but also in math classes where people are trying to find some exciting hands-on way to teach equations. So one of my favorite lessons from this is you code the drone to orbit around a point, which is a common photography move that your drone just does automatically. But to actually code that curved line is a super complex equation. So that would just be another STEM integration that's yep. in there. Math skills are uh, high for Python in particular. Yes. So, you know, this is a product you could use potentially outside of that, you know, traditional drone focused class, you could use it as a tool in your math class. Yes, totally. So um, also with the Discover Drones Advanced Coding Bundle, um, you're gonna have access to our premium LMS, our learning management system, which um, again, we uh, just developed for 2019. So this is kind of a new product for us. Um, and that's where you would access your different courses. So it's kind of an easy way to have access to the three different, the uh, intro and then the advanced drone box and then the Python. And that would allow you, just to be clear on the LMS, this would allow you as an instructor to see your students' progress through the course. You could see how they do on any sort of assessment. So you would get with your product kind of an unlimited number of student seats for your one site license. All right. How are we doing time-wise? We're doing pretty good. good. Okay, so those are our coding options. And I wanted to talk about those first because they go um, really well. They complement the updates that we've done for Ready, Set, Drone which we're gonna talk about now and then uh, with Discover Drone. So um, looking at, oh, I skipped one slide. This is our splash page for uh, the LMS. So for Drone Blocks, when you log in as a teacher, you would have your um, 
options for your classes down the side and then a set of instructions and then your um, management for your students. Um, so updated for 2019, as I just mentioned, is our Ready, Set, Drones, which um, again is a mini drone camp. This one is targeted for fourth through eighth grade. And so there are a lot of benefits to mini drones. And our first iteration of uh, Ready, Set, Drone had an indoor drone um, that was engaging and fun and exciting, but maybe a little bit, um, we decided to go more with the Tello because of that programming aspect. Mm -hmm. And you can do more um, with that age group, I think, with the, the newest iteration. Um, reasons that, you know, that the indoor drones are so much more user-friendly, um, particularly revolve around the fact that you can fly a do uh, drone inside without having to get a pilot's license or getting permission from the FAA. And that is one of the biggest benefits with discover drones or with some of the larger drones we have to fly outside there are a certain set of rules that everybody whether you have your pilot's license or not have to follow in order to be able to fly safely and to be in compliance with the faa but if you're flying inside those issues go away um, additionally issues of weather if you know it's raining outside it's snowy it's the middle of winter you can fly the drones inside and not have to um, worry about that impacting your, your learning in the way that you might if you were working with drones that you could only fly outside. So mini drones are, you know, they're smaller, they're friendlier, they're able to fly without regulation indoors, and they're just easier to learn. So as we're going through and we were um, updating for the second edition, we really tried to focus on the ease of use and how's, how are we gonna make this, you know, not just easier for teachers, but also easier for students and kind of more seamless for the students. So. One of the things you may notice too is there are a couple handouts um, in your panel that you can access and so you'll see there's two one of them is completely dedicated to indoor drones just because we've seen whether you're teaching fourth graders in a classroom after school program even at the high school level almost all drone educators we talk to are using mini drones in some way so it's really just a question of do you do just mini drones or do you use mini drones as part of also an outdoor drone program, which I think we'll get to yeah. after we finish up with Tello. Okay. All right, so looking at the Ready, Set, Drone second edition, um, one of the biggest and I think one of the greatest things about our update is that uh, we have created a whole brand new video series called Dronology Junior. And Dronology Junior is a video course that is more specifically targeted, I think, to the, to the fourth to eighth age range and for people um, and for the kids that maybe this is the very first time that they're hearing about or learning about drones. Mm -hmm. So um, it complements the Dronology course that we have had for a couple of years now, but we really looked at how can we make this more accessible and friendlier and easier to understand and interact with for those kids at the more entry level end of, of their exposure to drones. Um, we include six drones as opposed to I believe it was five in the previous iteration. Uh, I think so. And then um, the lessons are designed to balance individual work through the use of um, science notebooks and individual study with collaborative teamwork. So students are constantly switching back and forth from kind of individual work and reflection and assessment and then working together um, in groups to achieve the goals of lessons as they go through. And then uh, there are a lot of language art skills um, in this camp that uh, are kind of new to this iteration. The science journals are something that we work really hard on to integrate. So students are constantly writing, discussing, reflecting, and putting those language art skills into um, practice as they're going through the 12 lessons. And you know, if you're a teacher who is going to be using this in the classroom as opposed to doing it like as a camp, uh, you know, it's linked to standards um, so that you can, you know, Potentially, you could use Discover Drones as part of your language arts curriculum instead of just having the, you know, what is traditionally the science, tech, engineering, and math. Yeah, and this is kind of, you know, we talked about drone blocks before. This is, well, it's the same grade levels, that fourth to eighth grade. It's kind of a different answer to the question of how can you use drones as a tool for STEM, whereas drone blocks really goes into the coding and has really strong math connections. This one goes really deep into the science and the physics. So like Tyler talked about in those Dronology Junior videos, we have some great resources to teach about how do drones fly? What are the four forces of flight? And how does that relate to other types of aviation like rocket ships? 
um, and then also connecting to the English language arts. And this was, as we were talking to our teachers from the first round, whether they were in after school or in a classroom, if they had learners that were English language learners or needed any kind of additional supports, they found that they were using a lot of those tools anyway, of making sure that you were writing about drones, reading about drones, talking, listening, so to make it a really rich educational experience. So it's been really cool to hear from our teachers that yes, that was really important. So we really leaned into that in the second edition. So you would have all those resources. Yeah, and again, like all of our other camps, you know, all of the journals are included, the writing, you know, the utensils, yes. everything comes with this camp. So, you know, whether you're using it in the classroom or if you're planning to use it in a non-classroom setting, all the materials are included. So, you know, your students don't have to drum up a journal or, you know, that sort of thing. Everything is, is there for them to begin from day one. Including your copies. So you also do not have to go to the copy machine and make all of your copies of those notebook handouts. That would also come included. Yep. Scissors, pencils, the whole bit. The whole deal, everything, <laughs> yes. Okay, so next we're going to take a look at um, our Discover Drones curriculum. So this is our best educational drone for grades 7 through 12. Um, if you are, again, joining us for the first time, um, Discover Drones is a uh, very thorough, in-depth curriculum in which students are building a drone from a kit of parts and tools. Um, holding up our Rubik's Cube kit, hopefully you can see the whole thing in the camera there. And as they go through the course of building the drone, um, once it's built, then they connect it to a computer and they configure it using uh, free open source software called iNav. And so they're setting the drone to interact correctly with the controller. And so as they're going through this process of building and learning the bits and parts, they're learning the science behind the different subsystems that are included in the drone. Um, and so you have a couple of pieces of documentation that are vital, like all of the camps. You have your educator guide that takes you through step by step all of um, the lab cards. And the lab cards are the source of the curriculum where the lessons and, and challenges and so on are listed out. And then you have your flight manual, which has the build instructions. So typically in Discover Drones, your students, once they start working, to build the drone, for example, they can go through, they're going to see, you know, a list of all the parts. And as a teacher, you're sort of facilitating and you're going around and kind of helping where you need it. But this is a very hands-on, student-driven kind of experience, the building of the drones. Um, so highly engaging, very um, in-depth breakdowns of what all the parts of a drone are. Um, one of the things that we did with intention in creating Discover Drones is we wanted to make sure that we had a kit that students could assemble but they didn't require soldering. Mm -hmm. So there are a couple of parts that are soldered on. The GPS unit um, is, is attached, but for the most part, the students are assembling the drone from all the bits and pieces that you know an amateur enthusiast might if they wanted to go out and build their own drone from scratch. So um, as we look at what Discover Drones is comprised of, there are six student experiences that, that differ from each other as they go through. Dronology, um, as we mentioned earlier with Dronology Junior, Dronology, um, the main course is a little more advanced than Dronology Junior, but it's a serial, uh, series of videos and quizzes that students go through as they go through the curriculum. They'll watch, you know, a one and a half to five minute video on some aspect of drones and drone technology or drone flight or, or whatnot. And the videos kind of give them a primer for the learning that's gonna take place. Um, later on as they go through and construct the Ruby Q hands-on. Um, they're doing all the building themselves. They're uh, working with all the tools that are included. You don't have to provide anything or like extra tools yourself. It's all included there in the kits. Um, and then there are a lot of different STEM concepts related to drone operations. Um, you know, things like the electrical subsystem, um, looking at principles of flight like airfoils, how do the propellers, um, you know, make the drone fly when there's not a wing for the air mover like in an airplane and so on. Um, looking at flight simulator training, it comes with uh, a flight simulator that students practice on, which is a vital part of the program. Students put in the time learning how to fly a simulated drone that matches up with the specifications of the Ruby Q drone so that when they go out and fly the first time, they have um, a lot of experience already and confidence to be able to fly. You know, I was doing a training just yesterday with a group of middle school students who took their first flights with us all day and they had done the time on the flight sim. And, you know, we didn't have any crashes. Everybody was able to fly the drone down and around the field and to execute all the moves because they put the time in on the flight simulator. Um, and then built into the curriculum is also just real-time flight training and practice. So as students get towards the upper levels to the fly section, you know, they're actually going out with their teacher and 
flying. And one of the great things about Discover Drones is that we have um, basically a driver's ed mode. So teachers can pair their controller with the student's controller, and then they can give that student power over the switches and the stick or over the sticks to move the drone, but they can take it back. So kind of like your old time driver's ed where there were two steering wheels, um, you have that option as a teacher. So you know, when you go out and fly the first time, you don't have to worry about your students getting completely out of control. You can take that control back if for some reason they they lose control and they fly off somewhere they're not supposed to be or they just panic. Um, you just flip a switch and then uh, you have control. And so that's a, a very helpful thing, both for the teachers and for, for the students to feel confident that, you know, that they're going to be able to fly uh, without causing an accident. And then each of the lessons has open-ended extensions. So there's lots of room to expand out from the basic curriculum. We provide several suggestions and uh, ideas for how that can be done. Um, you know, but your students will often come up with ideas that uh, complement what they had just learned. So the real world student-driven learning is built into the philosophy that went behind uh, developing Discover Drones. Yeah, and to give you some examples there, some of those might be like after they learn about the laws and regs to do some research on what the most recent ones are, because they change a lot, and then write a position paper. Do you think people should be on board? Do you think the rules should be changed? There's always lots of room for controversy there. Some of the other ones are to create a tutorial teaching someone everything you've learned about how to fly a drone, which would be the technological literacy. Some of the other stuff though, if you have the Ruby queue there, it's been really cool to hear how people, once their students have those basic skills, are using Ruby queue as a platform. So you can see Tyler has his FAA registration number here, but there's also some different mounting holes. So we've seen different people do engineering challenges where you're using Ruby queue for delivering. We've seen people put a photo camera set up here. So just like a GoPro, you can mount and then capture better quality photos. Um, we're probably getting to this soon too, but this camera, which is not typically electrical tape, this is one that's been through <laughs> that the- one had, Yeah, that one had an accident recently. Um, but this here is an FPV camera, so you're getting that first person view, right. like when Tyler was talking about the races in Paris. Um, so that's often the most engaging, but from there you can definitely expand into these other aspects. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned the vocal. We're going to look at the first person view here in a second. That is one of the big selling points of this mm -hmm. for students. Um, the camera on this drone is not a surveillance camera, so it's not meant to like take pictures and that sort of thing. That's used to steer the drone. So if you, um, you know, we go through and everything that you need to build the Ruby Q is included in that red gratinol that I just showed you, the parts, the tools, the build plan. Um, we'll skip over the uh, frame and stuff there. Also included in addition to the drone are radio controllers that are, you know, what you use to control it and then the FPV goggles. And so those goggles you put on and um, they aren't VR. Sometimes people ask if it's a VR. It's not. It's just like a television set, basically, that gets a live television feed from the antenna on the drone to the goggles. So that when you're flying the drone FPV, what you're seeing is as though you were sitting on the drone moving through what you're moving through. Um, it uses an old school 5.8 frequency. If you are, uh, you know, of my generation, you probably remember having antenna television and it's the exact same type of signal. So um, there's zero signal latency, which is a pretty big issue with FPV drones um, in that there's no, you know, there's no gap between when you move the stick on your controller and what the drone does, um, which is hugely important when it comes to the racing drones. So the FPV, that stands for per, uh, first person view, if you are not a gamer, or you aren't uh, familiar with the term, um, but that's that view right out the nose of the camera. And so um, the flight sim is, is also designed to give you that FPV experience. So if you're not comfortable with it as a teacher, um, this is something, this is one of uh, the products that does take a little bit more investment uh, from the teacher up front. Um, this is not a camp that you can pick up an hour before your students come and like be ready to implement, um, but our instructions and, um, you know, our guidance for the teachers on how to set up and the pre-implementation uh, steps are super clear and, and easy to follow. And for those teachers that uh, really want to get in there and teach an advanced kind of drone product, um, it's very thorough and, and we get great feedback all the time on, on ease of use, even for those teachers that don't have uh, any prior like FPV type experience. And that's where we didn't limit ourselves to one best drone for STEM education. You know, like Tyler said, Discover Drones is not the best drone for everyone. 
So if you're in a situation where you think, you know, I have maybe a day to prep, you might look at some of the ones with the tellos and start there. But if you have an instructor that wants to really invest or has that background, or if you want to do a deep dive in like a high school technology class where you want to do a whole semester, then Discover Drones and RubyCube does fit really well. And it does, you know, you'll notice that there's some crossover in the recommended age ranges, right? right. And say with Ready, Set, Drone, um, you know, in Drone Blocks, it's four to eight, and then RubyCube, Discover Drones, is like seven to 12. In that kind of middle school, junior high, it really is just gonna depend on, you know, the nature of your students, what your, you know, both products could work equally well there, depending on how much time you have to invest. Um, we do have a lot of, schools that have used Discover Drones very successfully with students that are in seventh, eighth, ninth grade. So it's not just for that upper end, it really is um, a product that can be used successfully across that whole seventh to 12th grade. But just generally speaking, it is more um, involved Discover Drones than Ready Set Drones. And you know, primarily the, the biggest difference is, you know, this is an outdoor drone, you would not fly a Q inside, um, whereas the Telos, you know, can easily be used in a classroom or a gym or out in the hall or, or whatnot so it also relates to too what your objective is you know rubyq will give you a deep holistic look at how do drones work that'll touch on engineering and data science and computer science if you really specifically want to look at coding then you might want to look at some of those high school tele options yeah. that we mentioned or you could do both which i think we'll also and we're going to talk about that yeah in just a minute also included in discover drones um i think it's worth mentioning here uh we talked about like the flight simulator you um may have a class of 25 or 30 students and you only get you know five of the big tyrannus controllers which can be used on the flight sim but we also provide gaming controllers for students to do practice so they can learn the skills of flight on the flight simulator and then the batteries. Um, lithium polymer batteries are often called LiPo batteries as an abbreviation. Um, and they are very powerful batteries. They're the only ones that can put out enough power uh, to do what we want drones to do. And so that said, they come with, um, Discover Drones comes with the batteries. It comes with a special charger to charge the batteries and then LiPo safe bags. Um, LiPos can be uh, more volatile than other types of batteries, especially if they aren't treated um, safely, so we include you know a full set of documentation and safety protocols to follow, and all of the materials that you need to you know safely be working around these super high power batteries. Um, don't let that scare you off. Just know that uh, you know for the larger drones that you fly outside, racing style drones, drones that are used in industry, they all use these kinds of batteries. So a lot of um, care went into you know our battery guide and, and making sure that best practices are followed for safety when it comes to um, how we power our drones. All right, and then the last part, um, next part that we're gonna talk about are the uh, lab cards. So our PCS lab cards, the curriculum roadmap for Discover Drones is set out um, in four different levels. And so as students progress through levels, um, there are multiple possible ways that you can implement this. And the educator guide that comes with it has some suggested roadmaps based on um, some common scenarios. So like if you were a teacher that was planning on using Discover Drones once a week in an elective course for a semester, for example, there are pacing guides for that. Or if you are somebody that was using Discover Drones in a week-long camp where you're, you, know, you had students four hours a day for five days, um, there are suggestions on how to pair up the lab cards. But the basically, uh, lab cards are designed to take students through that process of building the drone, tuning it, which you know is, is basically programming the drone to connect correctly with the controller, flying it and learning the best practices for flying, and then the ultimate goal being that students would be flying in that first person view and doing some racing against each other. And so, um, again, lots of opportunity for you to expand that in whatever direction you want. And there's also plenty of uh, material there for just sticking to the lab cards, depending on what your time frame is and, and uh, how long you have to implement. And like Taylor mentioned, there are the four levels of lab card. Each level has four cards, and then the instructor guide has kind of the expanded version. Um, but we didn't want to make something that was so structured, knowing that some people are going to use this in a library community ed setting, which is going to be really different than a summer camp at the Y, which is going to be different than your high school CTE classroom. So you're not getting kind of your traditional, here's your hour and here's what you're doing every 10 minutes, here's your PowerPoint, here's your worksheet. We really believe that this is a student-driven activity. So we did mention a lot of 
trip, a lot of that is installing software and making sure your batteries are in line. You don't have to be a total expert on all the information on these lab cards. It was really set up to be something that you go through with your students. So you have a series of resources, whether it's the videos, these readings, a series of kind of increasingly difficult activities for your students to build their skills. Um, so it's you're supporting that kind of student exploration, whether than having to be like the drone expert that leads them through all these lessons. Yeah. And also note too is like our like for example the ReadySet drone, it is a very well structured camp with those 12 one hour lessons. So this mm -hmm. is definitely um, a different format than those basic camps of the 12 yes. one hour lessons. You know you could spend as much or as little time on any of these as um, you needed, or more importantly as your students want to, and like where their interests lie. Okay, so um, we're getting close to the end here, and we're going to take some time to answer your questions. We have about 10 minutes last, so, uh, left, so the last thing that I wanted to talk about were just some good pairings. If you um, are looking, like, if you're brand new, you don't have any drones, and you're looking for, like, what is a good solution for hitting both, you know, drone as a STEM platform and then coding drones, um, these are some pairing combinations that you, you might consider using. Um, the junior and senior high level, like, if you have Discover drones, your best coding option is probably going to be to go with that advanced coding bundle because there's opportunity there. You get three different courses, two of them in drone blocks and one in Python. And so you could, you know, potentially spend a whole year working on coding drones by going through uh, both the Discover Drones curriculum and the, um, the add-on of all the courses. If you are an upper elementary teacher or middle school or you're working with um, students you want to do the indoor drones and, and be something that's not quite as complex as Discover Drones, then our Ready Set Drone Camp and Drone Box is a good pair. And one of the things that um, I wanted to make sure to mention is that, you know, the Drone Box, like if you decide that you want to purchase, for example, Ready Set Drone and Drone Box, you can get the digital curriculum so that you wouldn't potentially have to buy 12 drones, like one set with each camp, you could get like Ready Set Drones and then do an add-on of Discover Drones, uh, or excuse me, the Drone Box curriculum. So there are certainly a la carte options for curriculum to um, make things easier to pair together. And, um, you know, you definitely uh, would want to talk to um, our sales. You can send a, a note to sales at Adventures if you're curious about a la carte options or if you see things that aren't maybe exactly structured the way they've been talked about that you're interested in. We have people that are more than willing to help you find exactly whatever it is that uh, is going to work for you and, and your particular demographic. And that includes, you know, we have these kind of set bundles, but those STEM specialists are really good at customizing solutions for your program. So if you have any kind of like special need or request or situation, definitely reach out to them and they can probably help you out. Okay, we've got about seven minutes left. And so we want to make sure that we have time to, to do some questions. So, um, the contact information is really super easy, sales at Adventures. If you have questions, now would be a good time to ask. Renee has been sitting here on the sidelines helping us out, uh, and she's the one that introduced us, so she's going to read us some questions, I believe. Is that? Yeah, definitely. Just a reminder, if anyone does have a question while we're getting started here, make sure to type that in the question panel on your GoToWebinar control panel on the right-hand side there, and we'll answer as many as we can before our time is up. Um, when you were talking about careers earlier in the presentation, I asked everyone if they had heard of careers that we didn't mention, um, and Christine brought up some good ones. She mentioned search and rescue, oil and gas operations, seismic studies, storm chasing, computer science, and roofing companies, which I thought was a great oh, list awesome. to add. Um, she also mentioned that a lot of drone operators are self-employed, so those might not be listed on those internet job boards, right. but there's a lot of opportunities there. Christina, I, yeah, I appreciate her her saying that. There are um, there are several apps out now where you can download an app and find contract jobs for uh, drone work as um, as it's needed. So there are people who get their Part 107 license that may not be you know hired full time, for example, for a company doing that drone work, but you know they can find contract labor as as a drone pilot. So those were um, yeah, those were some great additions. Thank you. So Kevin also asked, is the grade seven to 12 drone blocks package on the PCS website at this point? I don't believe so, but that would be a great chance to reach out to one of your STEM program specialists and they can keep you up to date as that one gets really, really close to its official release. Great. 
Um, Alexi asks, what knowledge can children learn with drones? What specific subject areas? She's asking maybe physics, computer science, and then do you use open firmware like PX4? Oh, that's such a big question. That is, that is a, that is a lot first. for that question. Um, I'm sorry. So basically, she three different. Excellent. So first, what specific subjects are going to be covered in the drone curriculum? Okay, so it depends on which curriculum we're talking about, but I'm going to assume that that we're talking maybe about. Um, is Alexi can does she have, say a grade level? Alexi, what what uh, what grades are you working with? Yeah. Depending on, so we'll just, I mean, I guess we answer for both products. Like if, if you're working with that four to eight um, level range, the content knowledge there is not tied so specifically to, you know, like your math standards or your language art standards. It's really a springboard into kind of an exploration of STEM. Um, but you do get a lot of scientific investigation, um, in particular looking at some of those soft skills. You know, all of our, our camps um, incorporate not just like standards like grade level standards like NGSS or ISTE standards but looking at things like those softer skills like the 21st century skills or habits of mind so students are doing a lot of collaborative work um, you know in ready set drone they're doing a lot of writing doing a lot of processing um, you know doing Venn diagrams there's uh, math aspects so it's it's a really huge question to answer yeah. um, and I think you hit on a lot of them there. One resource we do have is we have a spec sheet for each of these products that will list the 21st century skills, the habits of mind, which are huge, but also the specific standards. So since she listed science, math, it sounds like that is what she's mm -hmm. interested in. And so obviously if you're looking for a math curriculum, this is not gonna be comprehensive. Right. If you're looking for science curriculum, this is not gonna be comprehensive, but it is gonna touch on specific ideas. Right. So for example, in Ready, Set, Drone, the idea that something moving faster has more energy, right, is a grade four standard. So Ready, Set, Drone, you can explore that by understanding how drones work. Or in Drone Blocks, the idea of angle measurement is also a fourth grade math concept. So as you're programming your drone to yaw, in different degrees, you're connecting to those angle concepts. Yeah, so she did say from 12 years up, but it sounds like you answered that pretty well. And then the second part there, do you use open firmware like PX4? Are you familiar with PX4? I'm not familiar with PX4, know. so you know the short answer to that is no. <laughs> but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not possible. It's not, PX4 is not included in the official like curriculum, um, I would have to do more research into that. Yeah, that said, the um, firmware for the RubyQ is based on INA, which is all open source. And so all of the firmware and flight configurator software for RubyQ for, right. would be open source. Um, everything for the Tello is DJI, so yeah, it's, it's not open source. Um, but DroneBlocks is also a very open sort of community. Um, I don't know if it's 100% open source, but it's also a very collaborative source based. Great. One more here from Bethany. She asks, how many students can work on one Ready, Set, Drone kit? How many kits would I need for a class of 25 students? Oh, you just need one for 25. Yeah. yeah, Ready, Set, Drone can cover up to 25, 30. So it comes with six drones, okay. and we say five kids per drone is really the max. So yeah. with 25, you'd be great. Three kids per drone is really ideal, but we know that's yeah. obviously not always the reality. So in that case, it would totally work. Yeah. Great. So we're ending our time here. Is there anything you want to add before we wrap up? Um, well, I, I want to remind everybody that there will be a survey at the end. So if you are willing to stick around and answer a couple of questions, it would really help us out um, in terms of you know seeing how well we presented you um, with what you thought you were getting and how to improve for later on. There are the handouts there um, that are available. So you may want to take a look at those that uh, will definitely add to what we've talked about today. Um, and other than that, I think we're pretty good. What do you think? Yeah, we'll have those handouts available as well as a recording of this webinar within 48 hours. So we'll be emailing those to all of you. Um, you can rewatch them again or you can share that with anyone that you think would find it interesting. Good. And so again, if you have more questions or you know you want more information, um, it's very simple, you know, info or sales at adventures will get you in touch with the STEM specialists that can give you more in-depth information than we were able to give today. We threw a lot of information at you in the last hour. So um I just want to say thanks for everybody for tuning in. Yeah, hope it was helpful. Thank you all for being yeah. here with us. All right, we've got some more questions. Bye, everybody. Thanks.
Bye, everyone.